слушать Вудби Терон Тласк, Which Country is more beautiful? It would be right to say There is nothing more beautiful than our blue planet. On July 17, 1975, one billion viewers witnessed an historic event live on television. Some 225 kilometers from the Earth, a Soviet and an American shook hands. This story is a great world first. It's the first space encounter in the history of humanity. And yet we were in the middle of the Cold War. Since the end of the Second World War, the world had been cut in two, East against West, Communism against Capitalism, the USSR against the USA. Each was developing its own space program away from prying eyes. This was the space race, with a nuclear threat as its backdrop. This political and technical feat, defying nature, went by the name Apollo-Soyuz Test Project. Only those involved in spaceflight were brave enough to break the ice of the Cold War. Driven by the wishes of their leaders and surrounded by thousands of engineers and technicians from the two countries, cosmonauts and astronauts showed the whole world that cooperation was possible. But it was a very visible demonstration that the people of the two great nations could work together. The flight did play a part in propaganda. They had only three years, just three years to overcome all the difficulties and pull off a series of technical exploits together. We were not certain how safe it was to work with the Russians in space. You can see a com uh, command device signal. The first time we went to NASA, there was a poster bearing the legend, Beware, the Russians are coming. Three years during which the teams got to know each other. The commanders, Stafford and Leonov, forged a friendship that has withstood time. We are like two brothers from two continents. USA, USSR, two conflicting superpowers. Apollo, Soyuz, two differing technologies. Thomas Stafford, Alexei Leonov, two opposing ideologies. But all of these came together in a firm handshake. From the ruins of the Second World War, the USA and the USSR were seen as the two main victors called upon to rule the world. On April 25, 1945, armies from the two countries met in Germany on the banks of the river Elbe and symbolically signed the end of the conflict in Europe. Historic pictures of the last days of the war in Europe show American and Russian troops as they joined at Torgau on the river Elbe, splitting German armies in two. At the same time, in Oklahoma and on the shores of the Baltic Sea, two high schoolers, Thomas Stafford and Alexei Leonov, were dreaming of conquering the sky and its stars. Neither the American nor the Soviet knew it yet, but their destiny was already linked to this symbolic handshake. The cozy brotherhood between the United States and the USSR was short-lived. In the field of world affairs, each power wanted to impose its ideology on the rest of the world. When an iron curtain came down across Europe, it signaled the start of the Cold War. The USA and the USSR fought a fierce technological battle in the field of space travel, often referred to as the space race. Their aim was clearly to show the other and the rest of the world the scope of their power, not merely scientific, but military too. The Soviets made a flying start in their ascent to the stars in 1957, putting into orbit the first satellite, Sputnik, and the first animal, Laika. In 1961, the first man, Gagarin. And in 1963, the first woman, Tereshkova. The United States reeled under the blows, but bounced back with an ambitious space program called Apollo, which targeted the moon. Space is there, and we're going to climb it and the moon and the planets are there, and new hopes for knowledge and peace are there. In 1969, Neil Armstrong and his One Small Step gave the Americans a clear lead. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. 
When lunar euphoria had dissipated, the Earth's inhabitants were left dreading the day their world would be wiped out by the fallout from a nuclear apocalypse. After a quarter of a century of frantic arms race, the two sides realized that they possessed enough nuclear weapons to destroy each other reciprocally, and much more besides. Action was needed. Discussions began between U.S. President Richard Nixon and the General Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, Leonid Brezhnev. In the early 1970s, relations between the Soviet Union and the United States improved markedly. This period was called détente. Agreements of great importance were signed in 1972 between the USSR and the USA in the field of strategic arms limitation. On May 22, 1972, Richard Nixon became the first American president to visit Moscow. During the trip, the USSR and the United States signed the SALT-1 agreement, which banned both countries from increasing their number of intercontinental weapons. The phase of appeasement also extended to other areas. Nixon, President, president Nixon and the President of NASA, Fletcher, called our Prime Minister Kosygin and the President of our Academy of Sciences, Keldich. And Nixon said, we find ourselves in an extreme situation. Any madman could start a war. After negotiations, the leaders of the two countries committed to space cooperation. Article 3 provided for the design of a docking system between American and Soviet spacecraft. An experimental flight involving Apollo and Soyuz was envisaged for 1975. The Apollo-Soyuz mission was, via technicians, scientists, engineers and astronauts, a way of making a connection that the politicians couldn't make between themselves on the serious topics of the time. The war in Vietnam, the unrest in Africa, in South America, the planet was one big trouble spot. Among the cosmonauts, as among the astronauts, initial reactions to the announcement of this future cooperation were muted. Alan Bean was the fourth man to walk on the moon. Well, Russia was this mysterious country off in the distance that uh, had, for a while, seemed like a threat to our peace here. We did have a chance during those years to meet some uh, Soviet cosmonauts at the Paris Air Show, for example, and we liked them a lot, and we could see that they were like us and we were like them. This special aeronautics and space report brought to you by NASA. ASTP, Apollo Soyuz Test Project. Each country will launch and fly its own spacecraft, but share. The real goal of the Apollo Soyuz mission was to make absolutely certain that the two spacecraft can dock both the Soviet Union and the United States of America, and very soon there will be some from Europe. We'll send spacecraft into space. What if one spacecraft, something went wrong in it? Will the astronauts die? Or would it be possible to have some other spacecraft by some other country would come in and lock with it so that they can save the astronauts? Technically speaking, this flight wasn't simple. For the first time, we had to arrange it so that two spacecraft taking off from two geographically different launch sites could meet up in space and dock. Also, the interfaces made in each country had to be able to dock. Inside Apollo and Soyuz, there was a difference in atmosphere. We had to consider a transition airlock, communication systems between the vessels and between the Soviet and American stations, and with those controlling the flight from the ground. There was a lot of technical and organizational work. During the Paris Air Show at Le Bourget in 1973, the USSR and the USA officially presented the Apollo Soyuz mission to the public. The previous January, NASA had selected the crew that would fly aboard Apollo. General Thomas Stafford would command the module. 
an experienced three-time space traveler. During the Apollo 10 mission, he carried out the first flight in a lunar module. And on his return trip to Earth, he became the fastest man in the world, achieving almost 40,000 kilometers an hour, a record never equaled. I met the Soviet airplane at Le Bourget. I saw several cosmonauts. I recognized their faces. They got off, but I had no idea who it would be. That was our first meeting. The crews weren't yet decided. On our side, there was Chatalov, Leonov, myself, Filipchenko, and Kubasov. We were all in the dark about the flight. We saw the mock-ups of our vessels. We examined each other's ship. There were friendly meetings, but everyone was itching to know the final makeup of our crew. Later that evening, over a little reception, they gave him one of their hotel rooms there saying they broke out the vodka, the caviar, all that. They told us who the crew would be. For the Soviet leaders, there was no contest. Alexei Leonov would command Soyuz. Back in 1960, the kid from Siberia was one of the 20 Soviet Air Force pilots selected to become a cosmonaut. In March 1965, he achieved legendary status by becoming the first person to walk in space. Forty-year-old Valery Kubasov would be the flight engineer alongside Alexei Leonov. He knew Soyuz intimately from having flown in 1969. Two astronauts would accompany Thomas Stafford in the Apollo module. Designated backup crewman on Apollo 15, this time the American Vance brand wouldn't remain on the touchline and would undertake his first space flight. Next to him was Deke Slayton. Selected in 1958 for the Mercury program, he was grounded because of a heart condition and had never experienced the joys of weightlessness. He would pilot the docking module for the Apollo Soyuz mission. For perfect equality between the two countries, the mission logo was designed to be read in both directions, Soyuz Apollo in the USSR, Apollo Soyuz in the USA. Preparation for this first international mission could begin. The Soviet Academy of Sciences and NASA would take care of organizing the various meetings. In early autumn 1973, Though the global political backdrop was fairly chaotic, instructions to astronauts, cosmonauts, engineers, and technicians on both sides were clear. In order to work together effectively, it was time to shelve the ideologies. My first impressions? It gave me the jitters. We were off to a developed country with top-notch specialists in their field. Would my knowledge and my capacities match up, or would they crush us with their intellectual capacities and their resources? The American delegation had a similar taste of otherness when journeying to Moscow for their first stay on enemy soil. Астронавтам очень понравился музей. Они были приятно удивлены, осмотрев раздел, посвященный освоению космоса в Соединенных Штатах Америки. The Russian people were very interested in my experience of walking on the moon. And uh, we were very careful uh, when we talked uh, about this to not uh, say anything that was bragging. At first, you know, the conditions of the world being what they were at the time, there was probably suspicion on, on both sides about motives and other things. But we made a point of sticking to, we were interested in what applied to the Apollo Soyuz flight. That was also the conviction shared and passed on to the teams by the Soviet technical director, his counterpart, Dr. Konstantin Bushiev. We never talk politics. We were professional, you know. They were professional test pilots. We were professional test pilots. 
For the American delegation, the disorientation was total. Все, кто приезжает в Москву, стремятся прийти сюда, к мавзолею Владимира Ильича Ленина, основателя коммунистической партии и создателя социалистического государства. But similarities often hide behind the dissimilarities. Около мавзолея в Кремлевской стене покоится прах людей, кто среди первых штурмовал космос. We were careful never to compare uh, the United States and the Soviet Union. We didn't compare our television, you know, programs. We didn't compare the food you could buy in the stores. We didn't compare anything. And they didn't do that to us either. The American team listened attentively to the Russian delegation, which unveiled part of Soyuz's secrets. The astronauts noted in particular that the guidance and navigation systems of the Russian module were totally different to those used on Apollo. Throughout the meetings, other incompatibilities arose, all requiring solutions that they must find together to allow the vessels to dock. Uh, пожалуйста, Том, читайте первый параграф. Да. First of all, cosmonauts and astronauts would have to settle a sizable problem. That of communication. Each crew would learn the other's language. We started out, the baseline was each crew would speak their own language and the other crew would have to understand. But after about six months of working back and forth. It was going very slow. Not... Dalinia. Dalinia. Valley. Ah, Dalinia, Riki, uh, Volga. Mm -hmm. There's Okna. And one night, I don't know what they call in Russian, a vecherinka. Means a little reception. Always a U-shaped table with caviar, vodka, all that. The backup commander, Anatoly Filipchenko, we were trying to talk. It was like ESP, it came to both of us, about, about the same time. So look, I speak Russian to you, you speak English to me. I bet we understand each other better. Because if you're not extremely fluent in a foreign language, you will speak it slower, and you will speak it more distinctly. Итак, очередной этап подготовки к совместному полету закончен. Американские астронавты улетают на родину. Впереди встреча в Хьюстоне. Доброго вам пути! Despite the various cooperation agreements signed between the Soviet and American leaders, the invisible forces of the KGB and the CIA continued gathering information. The Cold War was still in the news, and these exchanges were particularly monitored. For Seymour Liebergott, radio operator in the control room, this trip to the USSR was a chance to see behind the curtain. The Russians were very uh, paranoid about security. And uh, as a matter of fact, I was warned uh, by uh, Bob Overmeyer, one of our astronauts, that stayed over there during the mission. Bob said, uh, the Hotel Rosia has 3,000 rooms. He says, and you have to get used to the fact that all of them are bugged. They all have eavesdropping. And if you need, a new, if you need clean sheets or a towel, open the doors on the armoire and say, I need more towels, and they'll be there the next morning. <laughs> so, and we saw all that. We saw the, uh, we saw the, uh, the uh, short men with the long coats and, and fedora hats that followed us around when we were over there. It's for our protection, of course, right? <laughs> Everyone wanted to know how sincere the other side was. Everyone wanted to know if, by chance, the other side wasn't doing all this for espionage reasons rather than political rapprochement. 
At the time, the Russians were extremely handicapped in the field of information technology in particular, as in the field of electronics. So one thing the Americans guarded jealously was that the Russians, at the time the Soviets, should not profit from any unwitting technology transfers. As you can imagine, the Russians were briefed by the KGB and the Americans by the CIA before the mission. Each had to know what should be talked about and what should not. And we watch these young men, these representatives of us, from two cultures, as they learn to work together. Gray matter was not enough to ensure the success of such a mission. Each astronaut had to prepare like an athlete, even if they were only part of the backup crew, like Vladimir Zhanebekov. Age 32, he was at the beginning of a very long career as a cosmonaut. The first time we arrived at NASA, there was a sign saying, beware, the Russians are coming. Right next to me, the door was open. There was a blackboard on which someone had drawn a space shuttle. And from its hold, bombs were falling onto a map of Russia. We laughed, of course, but the memory stayed with me. One year before the start of the mission, the two crews gathered in Houston where they trained on mock-ups and simulators. Together, they would have to draw up a precise mission schedule. Then the question arose of where the two crews should meet. How many dockings? Who goes first? We all fought to be first. Konstantin Bushryev, who had diplomatic training, convinced the Americans, with his characteristic gentle insistence, that the Soviet Union should leave first. Finally, after long negotiations, it was decided that on July 15, 1975, the Soyuz rocket would take off first and ignite the media interest, one of the main objectives of this mission. And the teams on the ground certainly got the picture. For the first time, the American Apollo spacecraft would carry four state-of-the-art portable video cameras and a VCR recorder. You know, I pioneered color TV on Apollo 10. I won an Emmy. And uh, so it was, it was, TV had become a very important just to, to share with the public because they're the taxpayers they pay for. It. I pushed for all the TV we could get because we wanted to show the rest of the world what we were doing. In the case of the Soyuz, it was the first publicly um, televised, live televised launch of a spacecraft. Everything had been kept in embargoed until they were certain that they were successful. So it was very important to the Soviet people as well as to the world. By 1974, NASA had lost its luster. Manned space flights no longer fired the crowd's imagination, and part of American public opinion held that these flights were no longer useful and cost too much. So the National Aeronautics and Space Administration were keen to make an impression with Apollo Soyuz. The keynote image of this mission would be the handshake between Alexei Leonov and Thomas Stafford. However hearty the handshake, it would cost NASA the equivalent of one billion of today's dollars. They practiced that handshake a thousand times. They rehearsed with models. They also worked on their speeches to have at least a base to work from. But what do you want? It's all a bit like theater. Okay. But the score, yeah, I'll provide you look three. Four minutes. How are you, Alexei? Glad to see you. There were lots of debates. In the end, it was agreed that the meeting should take place between the airlock and the Soyuz service compartment. 
The staging was rather artificial. It was cramped and difficult to film in that spot. Impossible to get interesting shots for television. We wouldn't get beautiful pictures. We had to film at an angle so as not to distort the image. Well, the handshake was very important because that was the symbolic meeting in space. Uh, it's, the handshake is a universal gesture of comradeship and openship, re revealing that you're, you are unarmed, you're, you're, you're holding out your hand in, in greeting. When the, the Soviet crew would be in the United States, all different crew members would have them to their house for dinner and the engineers too. All that, so we developed a very close relationship. In the United States, I want to visit Hollywood. Alexei Leono, Soyuz commander. Because I want to be a movie star. Colonel in the Soviet Air Force. No, I don't want. <laughs> Tom Stafford want. <laughs> Leonov and uh, Stafford built a very tight relationship. It was actually because Leonov is a very personable person, a guy that has a real personality. He likes to laugh. He likes to do things that he never seen. He likes to test you. And Stafford was more an upright guy. But Leonov's attitude kind of broke his tough spirit and made him more human. The two commanders would be flying two very different vessels. The Apollo craft was developed for lunar missions, so Apollo had extensive maneuverability and great flight autonomy. The astronauts could live in it for almost 30 days in total autonomy. Soyuz was less sophisticated than Apollo, and its smaller fuel storage capacity prevented it from flying at altitudes higher than 1,300 kilometers but Soyuz had already demonstrated that its automatic docking system worked when handling hookups in space. Today, the Russian module has become a taxi cab for the International Space Station. American and Soviet specialists have been to the aspects of the cosmic experiment of the exchange of information. They have helped each other to all the necessary technical data, to the system of management, to the stabilization, совместимым средством сближения, стыковки и радиосвязи обоих типов кораблей. The Russian and American teams would therefore have to construct a junction between the modules. This simple thing masked a terrible wrangle. Who would be the male and who the female? And neither one side nor the other wanted to be the female. The earlier systems involved having a device that was a, was a kind of a probe uh, in, in our language, we would call that a male part that would then engage what is a female part. So uh, our designers were interested in trying to c come up with something that would work uh, equally well. So we got to the point where we captured the two vehicles with a system that was identical on both sides. It had these interlocking fingers that brought the vehicle together. The docking system developed for the Apollo Soyuz mission comprised three petals used as a guide atop a docking collar. The collar absorbed any impacts between the two vessels, after which it would retract and maintain an interlock between Soyuz and Apollo. A competition was held between the two nations, and the Russian Tulip model was selected. However, each country would build it using its own methods. Okay, Houston, this is Soyuz. Uh, we are ready for joint work. <laughs> Two years on, their efforts had borne fruit, as the atmosphere between the two crews was looking good. Away from the pressures of their administrations, freed from the weight of hierarchy, far removed from the worries of the world outside, astronauts and cosmonauts of the Apollo-Soyuz mission readily shared precise information between themselves, even drawing on each other's methodology. I'll give you an example of what we learned working with the Americans. 
They would establish their technical documentation about the stages of the flight in detail. We would set the broad strokes and then fill in the details during the flight. They would describe every unexpected contingency that they dreamt up on Earth. Books this thick. And we learned that for serious flights, the more in-depth method was indeed better. That's what they taught us. Were we tolerant, intolerant? We just had a professional relationship between people who could understand each other technically and intellectually. That's it. If only that was the case with everyone on Earth. So by the time we flew, and I, I developed this relationship with Alexei. Sometimes even NASA and they quote their Academy of Science, that's where it was carried in. We would disagree. We'd say, hey, we'll work it out together. Don't worry about it. Two months before blastoff, physical preparations were stepped up and flight chronology formalized. To my right, uh, you can see a com uh, command device signal. Command device signal. Because in space, there is no room for improvisation. Crews revised their flight plans ceaselessly over and over, fine tuning the various procedures down to the last second. Everything is validated and then recorded. The two crews were ready for takeoff. But one problem remained. In two years, the Americans were never able to work with the real Soyuz. And finally I said, look, I need to see the real spacecraft. They said, oh no, the real spacecraft is now down at Bacanor. Nobody has ever been there. No, right, can't go there. I said, wait a minute. I have flown nearly a hundred different types of aircraft. I have flown three different types of spacecraft. And I have yet to see a simulator or a mock-up that is exactly like the real plane. So either I take my crew there and do it, or we don't fly. And, and the Soviet management says, oh, they didn't know what to think. And one of them said, we'll send in the backup crew. And Alan Bean said, you don't understand. If Stafford doesn't fly, I don't fly. It was called the astronaut union, how to strike. <laughs> In the end, with the cosmonauts' support, Thomas Stafford and his team's request was granted. On April 28, 1975, they were the first Americans to visit the ultra-secret launch site of Baikonur in Kazakhstan. The crews could finally take off. My dear friend, correspondent. When I see a lot of correspondent, I'm sure that is a very difficult work for us. <laughs> Right now we finished our last training session in Zvezdny Gorodok. I'm sure right now we understand each other. <laughs> I'm sure. Oh, very much so. What mostly yes we need to buy do to you ask him other problem. If we don't understand each other, we will have a lot of problem. <laughs> Good morning again. Jim Hartz and Alan Shepard from the Mission Control Center in Houston, Texas, live this morning. Soviet More than 2,000 journalists came from all over the world to Cape Canaveral in Florida to witness the takeoff. For the very first time, the launch of the Soyuz rocket was being broadcast live from the Baikonur Cosmodrome.
While the cosmonauts were on their way to the Soyuz, 9,000 kilometers away, the astronauts were having breakfast. In seven hours and 20 minutes, it would be their turn to take off. The cosmonauts took their places aboard the Soyuz and commenced their checklist, identical in all respects to the one the Americans would be using. At 5.20 p.m., Soyuz parted company with the Kazakh steppe. The moment of truth had arrived for the 460 technicians in charge of the launch phase, and indeed for all those who had been working for the last three years to ensure the mission's success. The Saturn 1B was ready for its final voyage. 600 tons divided into two stages to propel Apollo into orbit. Seven, six, five, four, three, three two, engine sequence start. Zero, one, zero, launch commit. We have a liftoff. All engines building up the thrust. Moving out. Clear the tower. At 3.50 p.m., Apollo took off from Cape Canaveral. We see Apollo lift off, inserting into orbit, and we wish good luck and to further meeting. In space, you have no place to go. So that was Apollo Soyuz's big challenge. Two spacecraft coming from different places, finding a common orbit, etc., which approach each other and finally manage to join together. But it was an abnormal situation for an Earthling who always goes from one place to another, landing and returning. So this was a novelty. For 44 hours, Apollo pursued Soyuz into orbit at over 20,000 kilometers per hour. The two modules had a date on the 36th revolution. Okay, copy. This is Apollo Control. Apparently the uh, TPI maneuver was indeed successful. Houston flight to Moscow. Corabel Soyuz got off the Kofke. Sure, the flight director and the other people here in the control center are happy to know that. Uh, I'd like you to know that uh, Apollo is go for dock also. Apollo Houston, I got two messages for you. Moscow is go for docking. Houston is go for docking. It's up to you guys. Have fun. All righty, sounds good. First, we saw Apollo's light through our porthole. We thought, we can see you, and it came nearer and nearer. Coming, Tom. Tom, please don't forget about your engine. <laughs> I was concentrating. See, we had put the same type docking target on the Soyuz that we had on the lunar module. And so when uh, I was flying it in, uh, my main concentration was to get it exactly lined up, which I did, and at the exact velocity which you have to judge with your eye. We didn't have a laser or anything. We just had to judge it. Apollo Houston, as far as our TV picture goes, uh, it's been real good. We were in front of our screen. Everything was plugged in. If something came in our direction, I'd have to dodge it. The ship was ready. If there was an alarm, we'd move away. But in the end, they docked very gently. Three meters. One meter. Contact. 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 
How we'd waited for that moment. We waited for the hatch to open. Our cameras were plugged in. We were watching them. We heard the cries of joy. We were so happy for them. The whole command center started to applaud this symbolic event when the crews from two countries met up in orbit. Before opening the hatch, the Soviets and Americans had to balance the atmospheres in the two vessels as planned. I was in mission control watching it and aware of, you know, what's going to happen. I hope it went off without a problem. The pressures were good, that the timing was good, the television would work, the voice would be transmitted. Did you want uh, panel six uh, mode device? You know, I knew that when uh, I opened that hatch, I had to speak Russian as well as he spoke English. I went and I knocked on the hatch, knock, knock, knock. On the other side, I heard this knock, knock, knock. I said in Russian, Kato Buddha Tom, who's there? The hatch opened slowly. We could see the frontier between our two ships. There was a black and white ribbon marking the frontier. Tom smiled at me and held out his hand. I was right on the frontier, and we shook hands. We knew that a billion people on this earth was going to be watching us, so it had to go right. You know, for us who work on something for five years, it was a long time. Uh, so we had been through so many subjects and so much detail to get to that point that, you know, you're just carrying this big set of decisions that you have made and choices that you've made about how this is going to work. And then when you finally get the chance to do it, it's sort of a confirmation that all those choices you made along the way were okay. Thank you very much, Alexi. Thank you. The main objective of the Apollo-Soyuz mission had been achieved. The two spacecraft had docked successfully. Some 225 kilometers away, the image of the two vessels coming together and the handshake between Alexei Leonov and Thomas Stafford was being seen all around the world. Alexei just gave me a present. Uh, you know who it is? It looks like you. Soyuz and Apollo remained docked for two days and the first international spacecraft clocked up more than six million kilometers in orbit around the Earth. Soviets and Americans visited each other, going from one craft to the other and conducting various scientific experiments together. In turn, the crews received the congratulations of their leaders. First to speak out was Leonid Brezhnev, the General Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union sent a handwritten message to Alexei Yeliseyev. I didn't want to do it. I don't have the delivery of TV presenters. We brought in a star presenter from the Balachov era. In the name of the Soviet people and from myself personally, I am 
We held out the letter and said, beware, each letter is important because it comes from Brezhnev. He stood to one side to read it and then told us, I can't read it and pay attention to each letter. I asked him why. He said, it's written El Brezhnev. I can't read El Brezhnev. It's either Brezhnev or Leonid Brezhnev. I had no answer. I asked my superiors for advice. Silence. I told him, say Leonid, and he read Leonid Brezhnev. New possibilities are opening up for fruitful development of scientific cooperation between countries and the peoples in the interests of, of peace and progress of all humanity. I wish you successful completion of the planned program and a safe return to Earth. Leonid Brezhnev. That's how it was at the time. The political context was interesting. At the White House, the message from U.S. President Gerald Ford was the same, if somewhat less formal. Admiration for your hard work, your total dedication in preparing for this first joint flight. And I'm confident that the day is not far off when space missions made possible. By this first joint effort will be more or less commonplace. And may I say, in signing off, here's to a soft landing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President. Okay. Throughout the duration of the mission, the crew has exchanged symbolic gifts. The two mission commanders also signed a document commemorating their meeting in space. From the Soyuz module, Alexei Leonov and Thomas Stafford answered questions from Houston and Moscow in what was the first international press conference given from space. What do you consider the Apollo spacecraft to be, and how do you like uh, the American food? Uh, no, as all philosopher says, the best part of a good dinner is not what you eat, but with whom you eat. After four days' weightlessness, the Soyuz vessel and its crew had to return to Earth. The Apollo module remained in orbit for another three days to finish its experiments. One last hug, and the astronauts returned to Apollo. The hatches were locked. The undocking of the two spacecraft went without a hitch. Apollo and Soyuz flew off into space. In the Soyuz vessel, Alexei Leonov activated the onboard sequencer, which automatically governs re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere. Apollo has left the field of view, and we cannot see him so far. After six days spent in orbit, the Soviets ended their mission in the steppes of Kazakhstan. Meanwhile, on Apollo, the American crew continued their interminable loops around the Earth. Final. Go. Guido. Go. Retro. Go flight. GNC. The re-entry procedure on Apollo wasn't automatic, and it was during this phase that things took a dramatic turn. Just before we hit the atmosphere, and we were getting a fireball and the heat, we had an electrical short on our communication system. A loud squeal, like you often see somebody starts to talk in a room, and, and we couldn't hear each other talk. So we knew automatically most of the checklists, but I missed one that would kill the electrical thrusters about the time we went subsonic, 60,000 feet. The Apollo module continued its descent, but at 15,000 meters, the crew was suddenly exposed to a noxious gas from the module's thruster unit that entered via a cabin air intake. 
immediately affected by the nitrogen tetroxide fumes, the three Americans felt their eyes, faces, and lungs were burning. So we got out and hit in the water and bounced upside down. That was tough. Was, right away, we were hanging you know, upside down by our harness, facing down. So I have got to get the oxygen mask, which were behind my seat. I let loose my harness and bang, I went down. So I came up clawing. Just adrenaline was going, reached over the, the couch, it just ripped off the thing. Got the oxygen mask to free and turned on the valve. That was when Thomas Stafford realized that his friend Vance Brand wasn't responding to his calls. I looked over at him and the mask had slipped off his face and he was comatose. So, wow, so I just reached over and, and put his mask on and hit the high flow valve with that. He suddenly came to like that and it really clobbered me, bang, knocked me back. And the mask fell off his face he passed out again. And, oh, God. So I, I made a lunge for him, grabbed him, got a bear hug on him, hit the oxygen flow, and he started struggling. I wasn't about to let go. July 24th, 1975. At 5.18 p.m. in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, the Apollo-Soyuz test project mission ended. Despite their state of health, Thomas Stafford, Deke Slayton, and Vance Brand, who had barely cheated death, saw their mission through with the world's eyes upon them. The three Americans were then hospitalized for two weeks. So it was that the Americans and Soviets ended their race to the stars hand in hand. History will record that for the first time, two enemy countries worked together on an extraordinary project that announced a new era of space travel, international cooperation. Beyond the actual exploit, the human dimension of the Apollo-Soyuz mission demonstrated to the world that friendship between peoples was not just a hackneyed Soviet catchphrase. After our flight, we were in San Diego. We saw on a building the huge inscription saying, Together we are better. That's what we had come to. If we hadn't had Apollo Soyuz, I don't know if we'd have had Shuttle Mirror or the International Space Station. Apollo Soyuz set the whole scene, and everything they do is based on Apollo Soyuz. How they partner? You see, TV <laughs> Dish Weatherford? We saw your little... Time. Forty years later, Alexei Leonov and Thomas Stafford are still the best of friends. And Their handshake has withstood the test of time because it is the fruit of a friendship that still knows no borders. The, I think originally, we were going to be a little bit further to the east on our orbit. But the way we were running our timelines, it worked out just the coincidence that we'd be right there in the area of the Elba River. Yeah. I shook Tom's hand above the Elba. Elba. That is highly symbolic. In 1945, it was our fathers, Soviet and American soldiers, shaking hands on the Elba. And in 1975, their sons shook hands above the Elba. What a symbol. What a remarkable symbol. 